My name is Rebecca Roberson, and I am the Communications and Program Manager here at the Elections Group. Uh, thank you for joining us for our second of Watchers and Observers webinar. Um, just a little bit of background information about the Elections Group for folks who may be joining us for the first time. Uh, we partner with state and local election officials to implement new programs or improve processes for voters and stakeholders alike. We also provide guidance. We have resources and direct management support um, for states and local jurisdictions. A special thing about our team is that we are all made up of former election officials and election experts from across the United States. Um, so we are excited to have you here with us today. Um, I am also excited to introduce our guests for today's conversation. Uh, first up, we do have one of TAG's very own, uh, Michelle Horney. Michelle is a senior election expert with the Elections Group. And we also have Roki Sulman. Uh, Roki actually works with the Carter Center. So we'll do in-depth introductions in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, I do want to introduce our conversation today. Um, so this is a little snippet from a piece in the election line that these two actually wrote um, earlier this month. Uh, to give you a little bit of, of background information. So voters across the country expect and are entitled to fair, transparent, and accurate elections. It's up to election officials and observers to work together to make this happen. While some see these groups as adversaries, in truth, their distinct roles are mutually supportive. And at their best, they can even be advocates for one another. Year after year, election after election, election officials demonstrate that election processes are transparent, bipartisan, and administered by professionals. Observers want to ensure that election officials and workers are doing their jobs correctly, complying with the law, and administering trustworthy elections. Their first-hand observation validates each election process and amplifies the transparency, bipartisanship, and professionalism that officials bring to each election. Today, we are discussing pillars two and three uh, that Michelle and Roki highlighted in their piece. So pillar two is managing physical safety and operational security. And pillar three is managing conflicts. Um, so I'm so pleased to have these two experts with us today. I will go ahead and hand things over to Roki first for a better introduction than what I gave. Oh, hi, Th thanks Rebecca. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Roki Sulman. I'm a consultant with the Carter Center. Uh, I've got 20 years uh, elections experience, both as an elections administrator in the United States and as an international observer analyst um, in uh, you know several countries ar around the world, um, been dealing with election observation uh, both as an elections administrator and as an observer. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you um, our thoughts on how to keep everyone safe during this process. Thanks. You want me to jump in? All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Michelle Forney. Um, as Rebecca said, I'm a senior election expert with uh, the Elections Group. I've been with the Elections Group for just over two years now. Um, I have about 14, maybe 15 years in elections overall. Uh, I did some work as the as an assistant attorney general in Arizona representing the Secretary of State's office there. And then I became a local election official at in Pinal County, where I was there for five years and ran 13 or 14 elections. Um, and then I moved to Nevada and worked at the Secretary of State's office there. And now I've, uh, again, been with TAG for, for two years. So let's get this started. Thank you both for joining. Um, so last week, we spoke about ways to ensure meaningful observation. And this week, we are going to discuss how election officials can perform their duties safely while observation is taking place. So the first question that I have for you all is, what are the primary physical security threats that election officials should be aware of when thinking about pot a potential increase in election observation in November? And we'll start with you, Michelle. Okay, sure. Um, I think when I was thinking about this question, I thought about it in two different ways. Um, there's first the potential for observers to be present at polling locations, vote centers, early voting sites, and then there's also observers present at your central facility where you're counting ballots. And they have similar concerns. Um, there's, of course, limited space in both of those, uh, depending on the number of observers that might show up. Um, there's uh, let me just focus on the polling places first. So, you know, the polling places, your your purpose there is for the voters to come in and be able to check in, get their ballot, vote their ballot, get their sticker, move on. Um, observers can um, facilitate that process by ensuring that you're following all of the rules and all of that, but they can also get in the way a little bit. So um, depending on how big your polling places are as well, uh, as I was saying before, the limited space can be a concern. So you might want to have some protocols in place limiting how many 
um, observers can be in at a time. Um, and of course, follow your state rules governing how many of a particular political party or nonpartisan observers may be there. Um, and then, you know, do you have sign-in protocols? Do you have some sort of procedure in place where uh, observers are supposed to check in with the polling place supervisor or inspector or whatever your terminology is for the, the so-called leader in charge of a particular polling place? Um, then I would think that you also need to consider some training of your election workers so that they understand that observers may be there and that they are allowed to be there and what they're allowed to view and what they're allowed to um, hear and see and all of that stuff. Um, and then some training to, to deal with aggressive observers. And I don't want to like do the whole presentation here just in this one question. So, um, but then turning to the central count, um, that's all, you know, good advice there too. You have... Uh, limited access or limited um, space for, for observers. Um, and you also want to consider, you know, what different processes can be observed and where to have your observers set up so that they can see things. I know in the presentation or in the webinar last week, we talked a lot about meaningful observation. So having signage in place or explanations for what various processes the observers um, can see is important. Uh, but you also want to have some training for the election workers who will be undergoing that observation to understand that they need to keep on doing their work while observers are present. And then I would say we want to talk about some limited access so that observers aren't just like in your facility wandering around freely. They should be um, limited to specific areas or have some sort of liaison kind of guiding them through uh, the facility. Um, and then of course, you know, how to deal with them if they decide to be disruptive. So I'll stop there and let Roki add on any thoughts. <laughs> no, uh, no, thanks, Michelle. No, um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I've been an election administrator off and on for 20 years and also doing election observation, um, international election observation for about 20 years. And never did I once think that some of the issues that we would face as international observers and sometimes in conflict zones, um, I would have to start discussing with election observers and elections administrators here in the United States. You know, never did I once think that I'd have to worry about panic buttons in my elections office or, you know, have to even have the concept of what a, you know, a shooter drill would look like um, in, in, you know, uh, a public building. But unfortunately, that's where we are today. Um, what we're doing at the Carter Center is we are um, expanding our role um, to U.S. elections. And, and starting to um, work with folks to do um, nonpartisan, cross-partisan election observation in the United States. And, and while we're doing that, we're taking some of the lessons that we've learned um, through all of our international observation missions and um, teaching folks here uh, in regards to security, how to um, lessen um, confrontation, how to de-escalate a lot of things, um, and... Uh, for election observation missions, um, it's important that they start well in advance and work with elections officials and the administrators um, to introduce themselves, introduce their organizations, um, help train their observers in what they are and are not allowed to do, and um, work with elections administrators to, uh, again, as Michelle said, you know, understand what election observation is and that these folks are allowed to be there. Um, and what their role is, and to also ensure that the observers don't overstep uh, overstep their roles. Um, you know, partisan poll watchers um, are are passionate about what they do, separate from an international or a, a nonpartisan observer. The partisan poll watchers have an a vested personal interest, and sometimes they're a little overzealous in their observation. And um, what we're working with folks is how to uh, de-escalate situations in a polling location. And, you know, as Michelle said, also work with folks at central counting centers or at your administration offices. When there's a lot of uh, election night, you have a lot of things going around. It's organized chaos. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, it, it, for, for to a lay observer, it, it looks absolutely chaotic. But to an experienced elections administrator, you know, there's a method to the madness and we all know what's going on. But we do have an obligation to try to explain that to those folks that are watching. And um, we have found over the past few years that um, uneducated 
poll watchers and uneducated observers tend to jump to conclusions when they see things that aren't perfectly um, explained to them and tensions rise. So we're gonna be working on things and we'll discuss some things on how to deescalate these situations and how to hopefully use education to prevent them before they happen. Great, thank you both. Um, before we continue on to the next question, I did want to let folks know that we do have the Q&A feature open. So if you have questions or anything like that for our panelists as we're discussing, um, feel free to put it in the Q&A feature and then we'll have a designated Q&A section at the end if we don't get to all of your questions. And then in the chat, I also placed a link to last week's conversation, um, which talked all about meaningful observation. So how you can curate and create experiences for observers uh, where you're still following all of your laws, your rules, your regulations, but providing a meaningful opportunity for them to observe. Um, so that's also in the webinar chat and all of the links will be added to that page shortly. Um, so our next question is, I know each of you have experience in a variety of different states. We talked about a few of them uh, during the intro, Arizona, Virginia, Nevada. Uh, Roki, the Carter Center also has programs in several other states. How do these threats vary from region to region, or are the concerns similar? Um, do different regions have different types of threats, or do the threats vary from election to election? Um, and whoever would like to start? Uh, yeah, Rebecca, I'll start with that. Uh, yeah, the Carter Center does have, um, we have three missions ongoing uh, this fall. We have uh, citizen observation missions in Montana and New Mexico, and then we have uh uh, another citizen observation mission, but this is led by the Carter Center um, in Fulton County, Georgia. Plus, we will be observing the uh, Georgia risk limiting audit that will occur uh, post-election. Um, what we're doing with those is uh, treating the threats relatively similar. And I hate to use the word threats as, as you know, an active word, but um, we're training our folks um, to uh, work with the elections officials um, we've had a lot of meetings um, in all three states with our uh, local elections officials, introducing ourselves, uh, letting them know what what we're doing, who who our our people are, and um, uh, again, focusing on the education aspect. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that we're we're focused on in 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 Fulton County is there is a lot of um, partisan animosity going on in Fulton County. Uh, and Georgia specifically right now. Um, and so what we're trying to do is in a bipartisan, cross-partisan way, um, bring people together um, to observe the election in Fulton County, um, educate them on the process. Again, we're educating ahead of time in order to uh, lessen any sort of questions that can lead to a jumping of conclusions, um, which can lead to confrontation. Um, so we're working on that now, and we're also um, uh, working with our folks uh, as we're going out and and starting the observations. Early voting is going to start in Georgia in a couple of weeks, and we our trainings are next week. Um, you know how to de-escalate both with a, uh, a observer, an observer partner who may be a little overzealous, a election uh, poll worker who may be just a little. Um, not understanding of the role or a little protective of what is going on at the polling location of the voters. And also for those folks outside um, of the polling location, um, we are unfortunately expecting um, a lot of self-appointed election protection, election protection people um, who may show up at polling locations to um, ensure that people are legally able to vote um, and have access to the polling locations. And we're going to be teaching our folks as best as we can how to de-escalate or remove themselves um, from the, the conflict. Um, safety is paramount in these situations. Um, we are stressing that, you, you know, people walk away from a confrontation. Um, you know, an observer doesn't need to record everything that's going on in a polling location. Um, and I'm using some of the examples that I've faced as an international uh, election observer where I have um, encountered a little bit of violence at polling locations um, during a heightened political environment and, you know, and teaching folks, you know, the best thing is to walk away and your safety is, is, is paramount. But again, we're hoping to, to work with our observers, the poll workers and the elections officials ahead of time to mitigate 
any of this uh, prior to the election so that hopefully none of this uh, actually occurs and we have a very pleasant atmosphere for everybody involved. Well, I would just add that um, in my experience in Arizona and Nevada, it's it's very similar. Um, there is, you know, heightened, heightened partisanship and some, um, you know, increased animosity. Of course, everyone knows, you know, what happened in 2020 and some of the animosity that came after that. Um, I think that a lot of the, the jurisdictions in both Arizona and Nevada are um, doing a lot of proactive work like Roki has been talking about, where they've opened up their facilities for tours or they're, they've done some videos of tours of their facilities. And they're also doing a lot of um, proactive education of the processes. So there's a number of videos on how mail ballots work. Um, both Arizona and Nevada are Western states and mail ballots are a much bigger uh, percentage of the way the, the voters vote that rather than in-person voting. Um, so there's a lot of questions and then there's a lot of um, mis and disinformation still circulating about um, how mail ballots are validated and how signature verification works and all of that stuff. So that's one of the biggest areas. And then also this, the voter registration side of things with um rumors about non-citizens voting and and questions about list maintenance. Um, those, those are the two biggest areas, I think, in, in those two states. And I think that kind of is, is going on all over um, the country as well. Um, but with the education and the proactive kind of approach, um, I think it's really important to understand that um, observers do have a right to be there and we shouldn't assume that just because they're there, they're going to be a threat. It needs to, you know, we need to start things off as a partnership where they're invited in to see how things work because hopefully they have a good faith reason for wanting to understand how things work and, and then have a plan for if things cross a line. Um, I know that there's been a lot of webinars in, in the past year or two about um, partnerships with law enforcement, um, like the CSSE uh, stuff, uh, and that's super important, but, you know, skipping all these these interim steps and going straight to law enforcement or kicking people out is probably not the right approach here. So um, education and um, having some some good explanatory documents or signs or handouts that can explain to observers what they're seeing and um, and what they're um, you know what they're observing about the election processes is is the best thing. Yep. And last week we did talk about how important those explainers are because some of these processes are difficult to observe um, because of the confidential information or the PII. We can't just sh show every watcher or observer a computer screen with, you know, your name, your address, and all of that information. So just making sure that folks understand what they can and cannot see. And I know some states offer mandatory trainings or optional trainings. So just making sure that watchers and observers are aware of those resources as well. Perfect, thank you both. Um, so on that note, what measures should election officials take to ensure the safety of their teams, themselves and observers prior to election day? Michelle, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, I think that um, training is, is obviously the number one and I think I was supposed to screen share something and I don't have it ready. Um, Anyway, but training your your staff to understand um, that they may be interacting with observers. And I think um, when I was uh, training my poll workers in my county in Arizona, um, we had what was called an inspector. That was the um, the person who was in charge of a polling place. So we provided some education or some information to the observers saying, if you're gonna to go to a polling place, you need to check in with the inspector. The inspector had a name tag, they were easily identifiable within the polling place. And then if they had questions during the day at the polling site, that was the person they were supposed to go to. They weren't supposed to be harassing the voters or asking every single polling um, poll worker different questions or the same questions over and over again. They just had that one point of contact. Um, and I think that that's, um, helpful, but then that one person can be overwhelmed with all the questions from the observers. So I think having um, some cross training and having some um, built in understanding that the inspector may have to step away. Um, and I say inspector, I mean, poll chief or whatever your your terminology is for the, the head of your polling places. Um, I think sometimes when uh, people are being bombarded with questions that can be overwhelming. And so as Roki was saying earlier, they 
understanding that it's okay to remove yourself from that situation and have someone else sub in for a while. Um, and that's the same sort of uh, perspective we would take with the central account facilities as well. Like you might want to have one liaison um, assigned to work with the observers or the watchers, but maybe not have that be a 40 hour a week job. You know, maybe that's a, a one day cycle that everybody takes a turn so that you don't get overwhelmed and burned out um, by the bombardment of questions, the same questions over and over and over again that, you know, sometimes don't feel like they, they're getting through. Um, but that's that's where that is. And I'll let Roki talk while I try to find the thing I was supposed to screen share. No, th thanks, Michelle. Um, one of the things that we're doing uh, at the Carter Center with our missions is, again, educating um, our folks about what they can and cannot do, what their what their um, legal authority is, is, which is very limited. It's to observe. Their job is to observe. Um, but we're also introducing election observation into a lot of locations that have never experienced election observation before. So, and we're well aware that most elections offices are small, physically small. And your tabulation room may be no bigger than a 10 by 20 room with a tabulator, uh, you know, that, and that you're, you're loading uh, data into. And it may be that, you know, not everybody can actually witness the loading of the votes and, and question things. So we're, we're preparing uh, in our meetings, we're preparing elections officials also with the knowledge that they're going to have some people coming in. And hopefully that they can uh, develop some resources and some trainings for those folks to maybe circulate witnesses in and out of limited spaces and, so that everybody has an opportunity to witness. Or if you have resources to have um, cameras and televisions that can um, broadcast what's going on in one room into another room so that uh, people can at least witness what is going on in those rooms. Um, it may not be perfect for everyone, but it's still uh, the ability to witness what is happening. We're also training our observers in, um, again, uh, how to de-escalate at a polling location. Should they run into an overzealous poll watcher who is challenging voters and a voter gets upset about it, or if there are long lines at a polling location, and um, no one is happy about standing in a long line. And if it's an uncomfortable day and you're standing in line for an hour, you get irritable. And so there might be some issues at a polling location that we're, we're teaching our folks to either de-escalate or to walk away from. But a lot of it is going to be, again, bringing the idea of uh, nonpartisan or cross-partisan election observation to the United States and educating elections officials um, you know, what is necessary on their part to provide for an adequate and um, acceptable observation as well. And then maybe not this year, but work with your, your funding authorities um, to potentially get um, some closed circuit TV access or, you know, recognizing that maybe your space isn't adequate enough for today's modern elections needs. And it gives you the ability to maybe get a larger office and, and work for some things and that will benefit your organization in the long run. So there's a lot of things that, that we're doing and that we're hoping to grow over the next several years as we uh, potentially grow our observation missions in the United States. Um, the key is transparency. That's what this is all about. It's, it's about transparency in the process. And we think with education and transparency, it's going to diminish the ability for conflicts to um, erupt in in polling locations and around counting centers and those types of things. Um, we're hoping over time that these uh, these types of webinars aren't going to be necessary. That we're we're not going to have to talk about conflict um, resolution and and de escalation of um, threats and everything. Um, but right now that's the environment that we're in. Uh, uh, so, you know, again, it's, it's protecting everybody and, and making sure that, um, you know, safety is first transparency is second. That's good stuff, Ricky. I found the thing that I was supposed to share. It's our, um, checklist that, um, can help you. Am I sharing the right thing? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is the, the Elections Group Secure HQ Unobstructed Counting Checklist. Um, and this is just a, a resource that you might find useful to um, help you gauge whether or not you're adequately set up for observers and for security. So you can see that there's um, information here about traffic, spatial organization, um, security staffing, if you decide to hire any um, security cameras, just like Roki was saying, like maybe you don't have the money for it right now. And, and again, you know, we're 33 days out from the election now. Um, it might be difficult to put some of these things in place, but this might be a good checklist to kind of go through to see if you have thought about all of these things ahead of time before things um, get more active in your office. Um, we don't really have something about polling places right now, but a lot of this stuff is transferable to um, the polling places, specifically like the observer management and crowd management um, and the staffing, you know, to ensure that you have enough staff for um, all of your locations. And um, as Rebecca said, we will include all of the links in um, in the chat afterwards or in the chat. Or... And one thing I wanted to say that I kind of forgot to as um, election observation missions, we have an obligation to elections officials um, to make sure that our people are trained properly um, in, in what they can and cannot do. And that they're easily identifiable, like um, for the Carter Center missions uh, in, in Georgia, our people are going to be wearing vests that are clearly labeled um, with the Carter Center or with the election observation mission. They're going to have badges that are clearly identifiable. Um, our folks are going to um, be very visible and 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 they're obligated to check in, you know, and everything else. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, the concern of impersonation. Uh, you know, of, of people, you know, coming in. I've seen it in international election observation missions where we've run into um, groups who said that they were observing under the umbrella of the organization we were with. And we're like, we don't know who these people, you know, are. Um, but they didn't have any of the identifiable uh, bags, vests, you know, IDs or anything with them. So again, we have an obligation. Um, you know, we're we're turning over the lists of all of our observers. All of our observers have to be accredited. Um, and it also gives the idea or not the idea, but it gives the local elections officials the ability to um, see the lists and vet the lists and everything else. And um, in some instances, uh, you know, we may not be aware of a, of a person's complete background. And somebody, you know, may say, uh, hey, uh, just to let you know, this is a person who used to work in this office and was fired for such and such a reason. You know, this person may not be a, a, a good observer or this person several years ago um, was a, uh, a partisan poll watcher and um, created issues at a polling location. And we may have to educate those folks. And all of our folks sign a, a code of conduct as well. Um, and part of that code of conduct is not to um, create issues, threats, or escalate anything um, in polling locations. We are also, as an organization, uh, more so in Fulton County, we're working with not only the county administrator, the county elections administrator, but we're having the county admin elections administrator help us work with the county election management team. Um, so that on election day, I know as an elections administrator, I would have, you know, uh, in, in some of the larger jurisdictions that I've worked in, we had a uh, a hub at the election management uh, emergency management center as well in case something happened on election day and then not just a threat or anything else I, i'll give an example of a, we had a car accident outside of a polling location when i was in washington dc and they hit a fire hydrant and right outside the polling location water was shooting 40 feet up into the air and it ended up flooding the basement of the church. We were in the polling location. And then we had to, you know, are we going to shut it down? Are we going to move things? And 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 uh, the power was shut down to the polling location. So there's all kinds of things that can cause disruptions on uh, election day that, that we're hoping to have uh, eyes on the ground and uh, information channels available. So that, again, if it turns into a, a threat scenario, we can either de-escalate or we can... Uh, get appropriate authorities someplace um, quickly. Another thing that we're looking at, just to, I don't mean to keep rambling here, but one of the things we're also looking at is on election day, mass communication towards the end of the evening. If a polling location or if, a, if there's a court order to extend 
the hours to a polling location, you know, making sure we have the ability to quickly disseminate information to all of our observers that's correct so that um, they can work with elections officials who may not be getting the message in real time and and keep communication uh, open at polling locations so that there's not any sort of argument or conflicts. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next question that I want to ask has to do with technology. Um, so how can technology be utilized to enhance the physical security of election officials? Michelle, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I think to me, I think it's easiest to use technology in protecting the, the election workers in the central count facility um, by having security cameras, by having some badge access to you know, limit access to various areas, um, potentially having 24 hour um, or 24 seven surveillance. Um, also, uh, I think Roki might have mentioned earlier, you can also live stream activities um, so that people don't actually have to be in your building. Um, and then a lot of places since COVID and even before, um, they had started installing plexiglass windows so that you, um, you know, can't actually like reach across a, a desk or something and, and do anything. I don't want to like <laughs> imagine different uh, scenarios, but but those are the main uh, things that come to mind for me in technology. Um, what do you think, Roby? Um, when it comes to technology, again, it a lot of it is the. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to start with the central tabulation area and everything else. Um, I'll, I'll, again, a lot of us have very, very small offices and we can't have the observers in there. I mean, I've had a tabulation room that was crowded when it had four people in it and we still had to have six in there to do what we needed to do, you know, on Election Day and let alone trying to have observers in there. Um, so we, you know, I had set up cameras um, in locations in in my tabulation centers and then put TVs right outside the room and there was still a glass window where you could see in the room but at least at least some of the cameras would would allow a little bit more visibility into what was going on and then it's important not just to have that but to have a translator there so that if somebody does ask a question that you're proactive in talking about what's going on in the room um there may be an issue when you're and we've all had it where our absentee ballot machine has jammed and we've had to pull ballots out and rerun a stack of ballots and everything else. And it's helpful to explain those things as they're happening um, rather than just go through the motions and doing what we're doing because we know what we have to do and we have to get it done relatively quickly because Lord knows the media and the candidates want the results yesterday. Um, but but it's incumbent upon us to, to talk to these folks because the more that we're not talking to them and they're just witnessing things and then they're letting things in their head jump to conclusions, the more animated they may become and it may become more of a, a, a conflict area or they may become disruptive. And all of that can be mitigated ahead of time, um, again, through education and everything else. One thing that, that again, when I, when I first installed cameras in my tabulation center, my staff was angry about it. They were they were angry. They're like, you don't trust us. You don't trust us. And I'm like, no, it's 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 I, 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 I trust you. Absolutely. This is for your protection. This is so that other people can't say crazy things about what's going on in the room, because I can say, here's the camera. Here's the video, you know, and, uh, you know, our tabulation room, you know, at the time on Election Day, when we didn't have a lot of observers, it was still under a, you know, a 24 hour surveillance with video motion cameras, whenever anything entered the room and, and everything else. And we have to have all of these tools. So, uh, you know, I, I really stress the ability to have um, overflow rooms and uh, closed circuit cameras with televisions, but that's not enough. You have to have a person there translating everything else. When it comes to an election observation mission on our side with the observers, it's incumbent upon us to have um, the ability to do um, mass texts to all of our folks to um, let them know of any sort of situation that may occur on election day so that they can avoid a certain area. Again, it may be something uh, as, you know, as a car accident outside of a polling location that has nothing to do with the actual voting that's going on, but it may, it may cause a disruption outside the location. So we may want to tell our folks to steer clear of that 
that location. You know, don't get involved. There's emergency personnel outside and everything else. It's it's not it's not worth it. Let let the elections administrators do what they need to do. Um, but it, it's incumbent upon us to be able to communicate quickly and clearly to our folks. And, and that does take technology. So one of the things we are stressing to our citizen groups as they're ramping up these organizations um, to do observations is that it's not just a piece of paper to write a checklist on a polling location on election day to see what's going on. You have to be able to, to communicate and that takes uh, resources. I would just second the live streaming. Um, that was a, a requirement under Arizona law, and we had our tabulation room under um, on, on camera 24-7 while um, the election was active. And uh, we were never, there was never a time where one person was in that room with mm -hmm. ballots by themselves. And I think that that was just such a, a sense of, of security and transparency that was helpful because we could say like you can see you can you can link to that on your um, official website people can log in at three o'clock in the morning and see that nobody's in that room doing anything unless you know it's election night and you're still getting ballots at three o'clock in the morning but anyway definitely second that and if you don't have it like i suggest that you try to um, go to your funding um, authority to try to get that in place because i think it's a really good um, use of funding Perfect. Thank you both. Um, I also, I third the live stream uh, sentiments. Uh, so I'm a really big fan of live streaming in my previous jurisdictions that we worked in and that I've worked in as well. So, all right, perfect. Um, so when we're discussing an increase in observation, what kind of training should be provided to election workers regarding personal safety and risk assessment? Uh, Michelle? Well, we're actually excited to say that in about a week, maybe more, I'm not sure, we have a, a course coming to our new, um, what is that called now, uh, learning lab, to our learning lab uh, for observer, not for observers, but it's for election workers about observers. And it's for full-time staff, sun, uh, seasonal staff, your coworkers, anything, basically just um, covering some of the information we've covered in this webinar and the one last week, and some of the resources that are out there um, to understand how um, you know, observers are a partner in democracy with the election officials and with the voters and how to um, continue doing your job um, while they're there and while you're being observed. Um, also, uh, we're aware of some great uh, resources that are out there um, by jurisdictions that are currently doing um, elections. Arapahoe County in um, Colorado has a, a link for their watcher training program. Um, and that's all I've got on this. Yeah, um, we, we've got a couple of things that we do um, for for trainings. One of the things that we we discuss, not in depth, but give folks the idea about uh, in observation, is something called Clara. Uh, it means uh, center, listen, acknowledge, respond, uh, and add. Um, it's a de-escalation tactic um, where uh, you use these these different items. Center. The first thing is to center yourself. Um, and this goes for election personnel as it does for observers. Um, understand that uh, as an elections administrator, when somebody comes in angry and everything else, they're not angry at you personally. They're angry at your position. They're angry at what you represent. So one of the keys is to not take, and it's, this is difficult. It's very difficult, but it's to, it's to not take it as an attack personally. So you, you have to center yourself and understand, take a deep breath, understand where this um, aggravation is coming from so that you can talk to somebody. Um, and then and then it's listen. Um, as an elections administrator, one of the things I found in dealing with angry and confrontational uh, people is that they just sometimes just wanted to be heard. And if you listen to them and and let them vent for a minute or two and then use the A and Clara to acknowledge what is happening and acknowledge that that they're what they believe has some validity to them, but then start explaining the R is responding to uh, offering a, like an open-ended choice to you know walk away, address the issue. And then the 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 last A and Clara is um at the end of the de-escalation, uh, if at all possible, to give the people additional resources to to look at to to help them with their understanding of what's going on. 
Um, a lot of the key, though, is is for yourself in a conflict, um, not to take it personally. Uh, you, know, you know, again, understand that they're 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 reacting to what you represent, not who you who you are as a person, and to be able to center yourself first. Um, take a deep breath, relax, understand that okay. Um, you can't react out of a heightened sense of anxiety or anger. It's important for you to react um, in a calm and sensible manner. Um, if that doesn't work and the person starts to uh, stay animated or or becomes what you, you believe to be threatening, then it's just incumbent upon you to uh, remove yourself from the situation um, as quickly as possible and, and have somebody call um, security or you know some other you know the police or something like that so that they can come in and take over uh the situation and they can have some you know hopefully calming words with the person who is disruptive and then ask them to remove themselves uh you know from the area but you know we're we're teaching folks some sort of de-escalation tactics um but an election observer we're also teaching them that they are not the election police that they are not to get into confrontations, even if a poll worker, you know, it, uh, we have the right to look at the the poll books or the electronic poll books to, you know, to see how that they're functioning, everything else. If the poll workers say, no, you can't look at this, not to aggressively say that, well, yes, I can under the law, I'm allowed to do this. Just, okay, that's fine. Note it on the observation and we'll deal with it in our reports, you know, later. Um, so, you know, we're stressing um, not to create conflict, not to create a disruption, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. So um, uh, it's a combination of educating about your roles and then um, educating how to de-escalate and walk away. Those are really good points. I want to move on. I'm going to skip around a little bit because um, I do want to talk a little bit more about de-escalation and that we have a few questions in the Q&A that I want to get to as well. But um, at the end of the day, we are all human, every single one of us, the folks who are administering the elections, the folks who are observing the elections, everybody's human and everybody has very strong feelings um, about this stuff, right? So it's really important to just take a step back and recognize that. And I think that, is it Clara? Do I have it correct? The principles, Clara, yeah. um, allow space for that. So I really appreciated you sharing that with us. Um, so de-escalation, um, we've talked about it a little bit, but it can be an important tool in managing observers. Uh, the Elections Group and the Bridging Divides Institute, or initiative, excuse me, at Princeton University partnered to create a de-escalation resources for election workers. I actually want to hand things over to Michelle to talk a little bit about this training, um, what it is, and how you all can access it. Okay, let me share my screen again. I think this one. All right. So this is our, if you go to electionsgroup.com, and I'm sure Rebecca is putting the link in the chat, um, our de-escalation resources for election workers. Um, as she said, we we work together with Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton to create some resources. Um, one of them includes a 30 minute self paced course, which is similar to the course that I mentioned that will be coming out in a week that's specific to um, training election workers on working with observers or dealing with observers. This one is specific to de escalation. Um, and it, it takes about 30 minutes to go through, and it's pretty great. Um, then we also have this um, training slide deck for in person election worker uh, de escalation training, which you can. Um, download and you can customize to your use. Um, if you need help, of course, you can always call us and or email us and we can help as well. And then we also have some information here on some organizations that provide some comprehensive in-person and virtual de-escalation training sessions. And then we um, we held a web webinar um, through the elections group at, with Bridging Zavai um, back on August 29th, and you can see the video here. Uh, and then we also have, um, let me know if this works. I might have to unshare and reshare, but does that switch? Mm -hmm. Am I, it did, yay, thanks Rebecca. We also have another link for just um, generic de-escalation re resources. And we've got a pocketbook uh, and some posters. So this pocket guide is pretty cool. Um, this is something that you can print out and fold up and hand to your poll workers. And this, uh, I think goes pretty hand in hand with the um, the Clara, um, mnemonic device that that Roki was discussing um this cool common counting 
ends up having, oh, I didn't, I didn't pull that one up, but it has like multiple pages that you can um, fold up and give to the poll workers to kind of help them um, handle any situation that comes up. And a lot of it is, um, you know, your use of body language and, and maybe not pointing at somebody or not um, calling them names or not, um, you know, but maybe like nodding and saying understand and rephrasing what the person is saying. Um, and then we also have some posters that we have found to be really useful to have um, up in your uh, central locations or even in your polling places, just to, to say like, you know, stay calm, um, understand that we're all humans and that we're all trying to do um, a job here. And we're trying to um, administer the election safely and securely. Um, anyway, these are uh, available. And as with everything with the elections group, if you wanna um, customize them, you know, let us know and we can help you with that. And I will stop sharing. There we go. And I just wanted to to, to kind of reiterate um, about the tools that the elections group um, has available. Um, those are tools that we're using. Um, you know, we're using the tools for the elections group to teach our uh, some of our um, in country observers. You, you know, the election, uh, the Carter Center, um, uh, our international observations sometimes are not done in the best climates and emerging democracies and and conditions that are not. You know, uh, our experiences are much different than observing in the United States in, in in some of our countries. So, you know, we were looking for tools that are that are, you know, a little bit more helpful in a U.S. context than, you know, uh, you know, I've had to be trained on, you know, first aid kits, you know, and, and what to do um, if there's, you know, car accidents on bad roads and these types of things. Those are the things you could face as an observer um, under less than ideal conditions um, overseas. But in the, U in the U.S., you know, the context is mostly uh, about uh, safety and interpersonal relationships and interpersonal actions. So we've been, uh, you know, using some of the, the tools that the elections group has to also help us teach de-escalation tactics and conflict avoidance. So I, I just wanted to say I can't recommend these tools uh, enough that you've produced. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have about 10 minutes left on this um, webinar, and we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A feature. So thank you for using that. If you have any questions, feel free to place them in there now. Uh, the first question that we have is, do you have suggestions for de-escalation training for election judges, um, like who you worked with in developing your trainings, any specific organizations, local police department, any election specific resources that are already pre-built? So I think Michelle touched a little bit about um, the resources that we have at TAG and the two training courses. Um, and then I am also going to share a link in the chat for the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections. They have a lot of resources and pocket guides for election officials and local law enforcement that may be helpful um, when we're talking about de-escalation and um, conflict management. So I'm going to place that into the chat as well. And then I'm going to turn things over to Roki and Michelle. Is there anything that we maybe forgot or something that you want to reiterate or further explain? Uh, no, the one thing I, 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 I do want to uh, bring a link to as well with uh, the conflict uh and everything else is um, dealing with your mental health as well as an elections official that, um, you know, that's another focus of the Carter Center is is uh, mental health. And we've talked about it with the elections group um, in, in, you know, working with people and, and you know, protecting your mental health. And sometimes this conflict can lead to, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, trauma that that you'll have to deal with. So just be aware um, of your uh, your own mental health needs when it comes to um, dealing with conflict resolution and uh, confrontation. And, and remember to take care of yourself because um, we can't run the elections without you. You're an important cog and you're an important person. And it's important that you take care of yourself. Yeah, and I would just add that um, I think it's important to include in all of your training um, to your permanent staff and your temporary staff and your poll workers and all of that, that they should be empowered to um, escalate a situation to supervisors or even to the police if necessary, and that they don't have to handle everything by themselves. I think that um, there's a lot of pressure on election workers because, you know, they're they're by themselves at a polling place with their, their little group and they need to make it run and they need to be there for 14 hours. And it's a, it's a lot. But if it gets to be too much that they're the permanent staff and the, the roving 
people that you have out in the field and your your partnerships with law enforcement should be resources that the poll workers um, and election workers are, are aware of so that a, a situation doesn't get out of hand and that they can you know continue to to get through the election day. Um, and the same thing with all of your staff at your um, your central facility too. You know they should know that if even if they're the person that is is tasked with dealing with observers, they should be trained on when it's okay to say, okay, I'm going to stop uh, stop talking to you right now and go get my supervisor and you know, or or I'm going to tag a coworker to come in and talk to you because you're obviously not understanding what I'm saying, or or whatever um, is is the right thing. And and sometimes um, role playing can be helpful in kind of trigger not triggering but like teasing out the situations so that um staff can understand they know they don't need to call the cops every single time there's an observer in their polling place but like when it's appropriate to do so um and i think that that's important like not to just bury it in all of the the polling place um training guides and all of that stuff but to actually like address it during training um and also with your your staff at the central count facility too I'd also like to say for for trainings and things, um, look look to your community. Um, your county mental health um, board or experts may have some um, de-escalation tools that you can use. And also, depending on how large your community is, your faith-based community may have some de-escalation tools or uh, within a faith-based organization. Or if there's a university nearby that may have a conflict prevention program. Um, to to use those resources. Now, I realize that those resources are certainly not available everywhere in the country, but um, I would start with, you know, your local mental health boards and see if they have anything. And then, um, again, reach out to faith-based communities um, because they often have um, some tools or some organizations um, that can help with conflict resolution. Perfect. Thank you both so much. Um, and then Roki, to your point about the mental health resources, I've placed a link to that guide from the Carter Center into the chat. And then I also placed a link to our previous webinar that was hosted by the elections group. It was hosted by Tina Barton, who's one of our senior election experts. Um, and she was joined by Avery Davis Roberts, um, who's the associate director of her program at the Carter Center. And then she was also joined by Captain Harold Love, um, who is a member from CSSE, but he's also retired from the Michigan State Police, and he is also a licensed professional counselor. Um, so that is a great webinar. It's one of our best, I think, to date. Um, so I shared that in the chat for folks who are looking for some uh, tips and tricks on resiliency and mental health. And then Michelle, in our learning lab, isn't there also a resiliency course or a mental health course? Yes, there is. Maybe coming out or is already out. So again, I'll reference you all back to that learning lab link. There's so many great tools and resources in there. Um, just peruse around. I believe it's free to register. So um, give those give those a look as well. Um, a couple of other just comments. So somebody in the chat said, we use cameras at our office. It's a matter of protection for not only our workers, but to keep transparency of the process because there are groups um, that are trying to undermine the process and believe that election officials are hiding something. So it works for them. Um, so that is just kind of an antidote that I felt was uh, kind of helpful. And then our last question, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but I want to see if there's anything you all want to add. Um, so what are some tips for poll workers on how to, handle, how to handle aggressive or disruptive observers? And we'll start with you, Roki. Um, I would say, again, is what we reiterated. I'm going to reiterate about what I discussed before. It's to um, uh, listen at first, um, acknowledge uh, uh, their concerns. Um, don't take it personal. Um, but then also don't let it keep growing and festering. Um, if it's something that can't be solved, step away from the situation. Um, you know, de-escalate it by stepping away and and calling the elections office to have them send somebody um, down to handle the situation or, you know, if necessary, um, send a law enforcement officer um, in order to do it. The key is to, again, acknowledge um, the concern that the person has. Um, try to talk to them um, in a calm matter, center yourself, take deep breaths and understand that again, it's not personal to you. It's, it's, it is to what you represent and, and the position that you represent. So it's not about you uh, uh, personally. So don't you know, try not to take it personally. Um, and then understand that if it can't 
uh, the person can't be reasoned with or talked down, um, call a supervisor. And then if it's uh, if it turns into something that appears to become, you know, a physical threat, you know, immediately remove yourself from the situation um, immediately and then, um, you know, try to get uh, law enforcement involved. Do not have anything to add to that. I think that was perfect. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you both for being here and thank you to everybody who joined us at home. We understand that it's a very busy time of year um, and we hope that this webinar was helpful to you um, as we are all getting ready for early voting and November. Um, so all of the resources that we mentioned in today's discussion have been placed into the chat. Um, and as always, our inbox is open. If you have any additional questions or comments for us, just send us an email at support at electionsgroup.com. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, and we will see you next time.